Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Sidereal Midnight plays Shadowrun Hong Kong. Where we last left off, we beat on a bunch of mummies and gargoyles that tried to transport us to the Dark Crystal dimension of infinite 80s movies references, and talked a little bit with Ractor. We're going to do on this episode is talk to everybody in Hayoi to see if they got any new conversation options. And I've decided what I'm going to do for these more just talking based episodes is I'm just going to, I'm going to do all the things that there are to do in Hayoi in one episode, regardless of how long that episode is, and then I'll put a lore tag on it so that if anybody wants to skip that and get right to the shadow run, they will be able to do so without having to sit through like three days worth of uh, lore episodes. So without further ado, let's ask Ractor more things. Okay. Welcome back, my friend. What can I do for you? Hmm. What can you tell me about the colleagues who stole your work? Today they call themselves Taylor and Hardingham. He speaks through clenched teeth. Crochet drags a claw across the ground, and you can hear the squeal of metal on metal. Those aren't their real names, obviously. They shed their former identities when they left their old lives behind. What were they called when you worked with them back at, uh, Grishin Abiyakor? It doesn't matter. Those men are as dead to me as they are to the world. My old colleagues no longer exist. Taylor and Hardingham are all that remain. They are targets now, nothing more. He idly brushes Koshe's armored chassis, chassis with the fingertip of his, of his right hand. Oh, how wonderful it will be to find them. What a reunion we'll have. This stolen research means more to you than money, doesn't it? He nods his head. Yes, yes, much more. It was my life's work, and it was important. Reducing it to a bargaining chip was a deadly insult, both to me and all those who would benefit from my work. Hmm. I don't think I've seen you get this intense about anything. The corner of his mouth tilts upward. I suppose that's probably true. This is a matter that's near to my heart. Indeed, it ties into the guiding philosophy of my life. Tell me, are you familiar with the concept of transhumanism, the transformation of humanity as a species by technological means? Admittedly, I didn't know this part, but I am familiar with transhumanism both inside and outside of this game, so let's do it. Huxley coined the term in 1950, I believe. Yes, that's right. The seeds of the idea trace back even further, to the 1920s in J.B.S. Haldane, but, if, but it was Huxley who popularized it. And now, the transhumanist vision has progressed beyond philosophy. It is fact. Look around you. Cybernetics are a fact of everyday life. The synthesis of man and machine is the crowning achievement of metahumanity as a people. I believe that we are well on our way to a truly post-human future. One in which the synthesis of man and machine is perfected to the point that the terms become interchangeable. In such a future, the capacity for unlimited self-repair would be indistinguishable for immortality. You can see, then, why the theft of my research came as such a blow. My former colleagues hadn't just stolen from me. They'd taken my contribution to the future of our species and reduced it to a bargaining chip. Hmm... Honestly, having seen as much cyber stuff as this guy probably has, the brain transfer part may be a bit sketchy and requires some magic, but it could sound pretty reasonable. Yeah, I get it. I'd be upset too. I was more than upset, my friend. I was livid. I still am. But all will be made right in the fullness of time. I am nothing if not a patient man. I can wait. He rises, brushes himself off. And with that... I'm afraid I'm going to have to bid you goodnight. I've taken enough of a break for one evening. There's still work to be done, and it would be lax of me to put it aside any longer. Thanks, Ractor. It was interesting. He nods at you. Good night. Can I still talk to him? Okay, yeah. 
Darn. I used up all this conversation time. Though, I like that they make it so that I can't do that. Because I used to be able to cheese it so I could just talk with them even after they said that they didn't want to talk with me anymore. I'm glad that I can't just do that now. It always seems a bit immersion breaking. Even if I do want to know more in right now about his uh, past. Wu's cabin appears to be the only clean spot in the bolt hole. Does it now? I'm just gonna hover around this. Just for a few seconds. And then we can go back to things. His equipment is neatly laid out on his bedding, grouped by type, arranged just so. He's currently in the process of cleaning his weapon with meticulous care. Well, that's that, I guess. We're runners now. Hmm. Oh, definitely this one. Something on your mind, gun show? Wu holds up a palm. Don't. Just... don't. When we're alone, it's either Wu or Duncan. Gun show doesn't live here. Wu looks down the barrel of his gun, brushes off some dirt. And yeah, there's plenty on my mind. That's why I'm doing equipment maintenance. The discipline of it helps me focus. Process. What about you? You look like you want to talk about something. Hmm. Let's talk about Raymond. I feel like that's relatively important to the situation right now. Okay, shoot. What do you think's going on with him? I don't know, Shen. He was clearly obsessed with the walled city and whatever prosperity is. He sounds like a sleepwalker trying to stumble his way through a dream or something. A sleepwalker who hires shadow runners. Whatever he was doing, he knew it would be dangerous. Raymond was smart. Smart as hell. If he thought he needed runners to take him into that place, he needed them. Why do you think he came to Hong Kong? Well, he's from here, right? It sounds like he had unfinished business that he needed to take care of before... You think he's dying? I don't know. Yeah, me either. Just something to think about. Did he say anything about me after I left? You know Raymond, Shen. He taught us what he wanted to teach us. Told us what he wanted to know. Oh, told us what he wanted us to know. Everything else was met with a, with a wall of good-natured silence. He used to say... You are the master of the unspoken word, Mr. Wu. Once it is out of your mouth, it is out of your control. So no, after you left, he never said a word about you. Not a word. Let's talk about something else. Okay, let's talk about being Shadowrunners. What's there to say? I worked my ass off to pull myself out of the gutter and make something of my life. I did what it took to earn my bronze, and now I'm a mercenary hiding in the shadows of a foreign country doing dirty jobs that the cops need to keep off the books. It's the reverse of everything I ever wanted. You seem to be taking it pretty damn well, so let me ask you something. Who said y You said you thought that Raymond was alive, too. That we'd run the shadows so we could figure out what happened to him. Was that true? Yes. For me, this is all about finding out what really happened to Raymond. I want to say that just because... I don't feel like after, like, reforming in prison, he'd really want to do this for any longer than he had to. Good old Fist Sensei. I think he'll keep the name, though. In my version of events, he will keep the name after he stops being a Shadowrunner. Wu nods, clearly satisfied. Good that we're on the same page. I feel better knowing that. What's your opinion of Kindly Chang? I'd say she's got us right where she wants us, right under her thumb. What do you want to talk about specifically? Hmm. What about this plastic-faced man? Creepy dudes are nothing new to me. Even well-dressed, creepy corporate dudes. Between the gangers we grew up with and the shit that I've run into as a cop, I've seen all kinds. I just want to know who he is and who he works for. What do you think she wants from us? As long as her network keeps delivering information about Raymond, I don't care. At least for now. We need to stay with her. We have no other connections in Hong Kong. Without her, we're dead in the water. You think we can trust her? A triad boss, an underground fixer? No, I don't think we can trust her. But as long as we all share the same goals, we should be okay. Hmm...
Nah, he's a gang member. Makes sense. As long as we serve her interest, she doesn't have a reason to screw us over. Exactly. It's simple. She provides jobs, we do jobs. She gets info about Raymond and that plastic face man, and we figure out what the hell is going on. We figure out what's going on, she doesn't end up in the trunk of a car at the bottom of, of the river. Everybody wins. We should keep an eye on Strangler Bow. We should keep an eye on everybody, and that guy is definitely no exception. I've seen plenty of cold killers in the Barrens, and plenty more since I joined Lone Star. This guy's the real deal. I'm not sure if he even knows what the word remorse even means. You should steer clear of him. I'll be careful. Uh-huh, I can see that. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Gobbit and Isabel. I like that these keep opening up more and more conversation options, so I'm just going to exhaust all of them. They seem competent, considering how young they are. But then again, they sound like they've been taking care of themselves since they were pretty young. The three of us work together well in the walled city. Based on that, I bet the four of us would make a solid crew. Hmm. Do you trust them? As far as I trust any runner, yeah. It's like what Raymond used to say, trust and verify. They haven't given me a reason not to trust them, so until they do, I'll believe what they say and keep my eyes open. I can't get that dream that I had out of my head. You said you had one too, right? Yeah, yours sounded like a nasty one. I don't remember much about mine. I was pretty creeped out by our run into the walled city. Between that and all the drama, I'd be surprised if I didn't have a nightmare. He shrugs. What do you remember about yours? Just little snatches of things. He puts his hands on his hips and concentrates. The walled city was breathing, and it had teeth everywhere. And there was a tunnel that was so bright that I had to shut my eyes. And Raymond was there. He was either kneeling or lying down. I can't remember which, but he was crying. That's what made me wake up. The sound of my father crying. Okay, the walled city was clearly in his dream. He just mentioned it. Did it feel any different from other nightmares you've had? He takes his time, thinks about his answer a bit before he responds. You know how sometimes you'll be mad at a friend in a dream, and then wake up still mad at him? Then you treat him like he did something wrong when you see him? Kind of feels like that to me. Like I dreamed I was swimming towards a bright light, and when I woke up, I was out of breath from effort. Let's talk about something else. What do you think about their last run? Don't ask me. You didn't take me on that run. <laughs> okay, so you do remember that. Later's good. I want to do some cardio, work out some steam. Then it's rack time for me. You should do the same, Shen. A couple hundred push-ups would do you good. Hmm. I mean, I have strength four. I could probably bust out 200 in my sleep. He raises an eyebrow. I'd love to see that sometime, but for now, you should clear out. I want to get started, and this cabin isn't big enough for two. Oh yeah, and I'll do this, um, just a little side note about the nature of recording. I must have forgotten to save, because when I got back to this after the recording, I was stuck with the autosave. Either that or the save didn't go through. I'm just going to skip all this, because I believe we covered it in the recording, in uh, the last episode. So let's see if I can talk to Isabel. Hi, Isabel. Let's talk. Isabel's cabin is an exercise in controlled chaos. Her living space is utterly dominated by an enormous jury-rigged computer. Serpentine cables sneak from component to component, tying dozens of obsolete terminals and cyberdecks together into a single colossal machine. This is my personal machine. If you're looking for your mission computer, it's downstairs. She doesn't bother looking up. You can see that she's elbow deep in the guts of an obsolete cyberdeck, one of a half dozen that have been wired into her computer with braided cables. Actually, I was hoping to talk. Got a second? There is a long pause, then she chirps out a response. We're talking now, aren't we? Hmm. I guess so, yeah. Can I ask you a few questions? She leans in, scrutinizing the innards of the obsolete deck. Go ahead, I'm not stopping you. Have you been having weird dreams recently? Her body goes still. 
Yes, I think that everybody has. Me too. I've been having horrible nightmares. I know. It happens more often than you'd think. She tilts her head in the direction of the walled city. This kind of mass psychosis was common where I grew up. Everybody got it. Mass psychosis? Seems more like a magical phenomenon to me. Her voice quickens. I don't really know what it is, and I don't think I want to. I just want to work on my computer in peace. Oh, you know something. And you're not telling me what it is, but you know something. That's going to be a problem later. That's quite a machine you're working on. Care to tell me about it? She's my pet project. I call her the octopus. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. I'm glad that Duncan and I aren't aren't the only ones part of the stupid name squad. She waves a hand at the tangle of thick power cables that radiate out from the machine's central core. You might be able to guess why. Impressive. Yeah, she clearly did all this herself. There's no way she'd let anyone else touch her machines. Impressive work. How well does it perform? She's a monster. She yanks a fried chip from the deck's motherboard and neatly sets it aside, then fumbles in a nearby pit, but in a nearby bin for a replacement. An absolute beast. Hmm. What is this thing made of? Whatever I could find. Busted terminals, obsolete cyberdecks, aftermarket memory for Maximum Law's dumpster. Scavengers would kill for this stuff in the walled city, but out here, people throw it away. She chuckles to herself as she eases a card into an empty expansion slot. Most deckers are early adopters. They buy whatever's newest. Shell out huge amounts of new yen in hope of, ridding, of riding the bleeding edge. Stupid. Why? Because I can have five of last year's model for a quarter of the price of, of that whiz new cyberdeck. After I've finished daisy chaining them together, the machine that I've built will run circles around your hot new deck. Hmm. Makes sense to me. Good, that's a good sign. Shows your thinking clearly. Frowning, she yanks a stick of memory from the old deck. So, uh, was there something else you need? What about your portable gear? Your cyberdeck software? That kind of thing. It gets the job done. Might not be top of the line, but I'm comfortable using it in the field. If you should happen to come across any more advanced hardware or software, either on the job or on the discount rack at Law's Techno Palace, I'm not above taking donations. But barring that, I'm fine with using what I've got. Your call. Okay, so I can give her new decking gear. Hmm. I will see about doing that. Hmm, okay, so... Can we talk about the ambush at Victoria Harbor? I'd rather not. I lost friends there. Oh my god, that's so... That's so jerkish. Yeah, this one. Duncan and I didn't come out of the attack unscathed either. They shot Car Carter down, same as your friends. Was she your friend? You didn't seem that close. She returns her attention to the octopus, turning her back on you. These guys have very clear body language. Like, Ractor has his drone, Gobbit has her rats, Isabel has her computer. They all have something they fiddle with to show their emotions. I guess that's what makes us a good team. I'd like to get to know you better. Tell me something about yourself. Something? She pauses for a moment. Okay, I don't like small talk. Does that count? Hmm. Sure, it tells me that you don't want to be social. Look, it's nothing personal. I just don't think that I'm a very interesting person. Says the person who built this from, like, uh, from bits and bobs. Uh, I'm not that interesting. Nothing about this is interesting. She shrugs. Sorry if that disappoints you. You don't like talking about things other than your computer very much, do you? There's a long pause before she responds. When she does, she sounds vaguely hurt. I prefer not to. Nothing personal, it's just the way I, that I am. Hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. I just want to know who I'm running with, don't you? Yes, you're still a mystery to me. There's a long pause. 
I don't like mysteries, but I do enjoy solving them. She turns, gives you her full attention. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you a question, something personal. After you've given me an answer, you get to ask me something. Think of it like a game of questions. We take turns until one of us wants to quit. Deal? Deal. You go first. Ask away. It'll give me it'll give me an opportunity to uh, better develop Fist Sensei's character anyway. We'll start off easy. Tell me what you really think about Duncan. I love and respect the man. He's family. He can be a pain in the ass, but he's like a brother to me. We're old friends who drifted apart, that's all. He was a me he was means to an end back in the Barrens, now he's just irritating. I don't have any feelings about him one way or the other. I feel like if he was if he was lying so boldly to Duncan's face just to get away from telling him what he did, Fist Sensei really cares about Duncan. I love and respect the man. He's family. She cocks her head inquisitively. I've heard how you abandoned him back in Seattle. If that's love, you've got a funny way of showing it. Well, you've answered my question. I guess that makes it your turn. Hmm. Which one am I most curious about? Where did you... Yeah, this one, because... I can't imagine she picked up skills to do this in the Walled City. Where did you learn to deck? The Wampoa. I lived there for a while after escaping the Walled City. The people there were... difficult. We didn't get along, but it was a great place to learn. And that would make it my turn. She pauses, considering. So tell me, what was your connection to Raymond Black? Okay... He was my benefactor and mentor. I respected him. He was like a father to me. Me and Duncan, he got us out of the Barrens. This is an interesting question, because I don't feel like Fist Sensei would have been, like, absolutely, like, loving Raymond, or he wouldn't have still been doing, like, gang activity stuff that got him into some, ter into some terrible situation. But at the same time, I'm wondering if prison reform would have changed that. I think if he thought he was trapped there for all eternity, he probably would have gone over the fact that he regretted treating Raymond the way that he did when he was a teenager. So by this point, by the time he's been out of jail, probably this one. He was like a father to me. Me and Duncan. He got us out of the Barrens. In that case, I'm sorry for your loss. Losing the ones that you love is hard. Your turn. Ask me a question, and I'll give you an answer. Hmm. How did you and Gobbit meet? Her brow furrows, and after a moment, she screws her eyes shut. We met as kids in the walled city. My prison was her playground. You okay, Isabel? Of course I'm okay. I'm fine. She sifts her gaze to the octopus. I just have a hard time remembering those days. My childhood is kind of a blur. Uh-oh. That's never a good sign. Amnesia in any sort of TV show, book, game, or movie is always a bad sign. And that brings us back to my turn. She gestures at the cabin walls around you. You enjoy it, don't you? Living like this. Working the shadows. No. Yeah, I feel like this is definitely it, in this case. This is survival. I do what I have to. Enjoyment doesn't come into it. She blinks. We may have more in common than I'd thought. Your turn again. Go ahead. Ask me something. How long have you been running the shadows with Gobbit? That's a good question. I guess about four years now? A decent stretch by anyone's reckoning. My turn again. Her head tilts as she as she studies your face. And, I think, my last question for you. You're stuck here, marooned. You and Duncan both. He's obviously unhappy with the situation. He keeps going on about the things that he left behind. What about you? Is there anything that you want to get back to? Okay, so... That's, that's amusing, that this is a lie. 
So this is the question. Did he have a life to go back to? Because from, from everything that we've heard so far, he got out of prison recently. Was there anything there in Seattle? I mean, Duncan wasn't there anymore, and Raymond was off somewhere else. What kind of life was he living there? I mean, probably other than, like, the gangs that he ran with in the in the olden days, who he was now done with because of having reformed. Those two were probably his entire world. I mean, what was left? At least here, he has almost friends and something to do. Yeah, I think it's this one. Nothing worth mentioning. Truth be told, I'm enjoying the change of scenery. Nothing? There isn't anything about your old life that you'll miss? I don't know whether to envy you or feel sorry for you. I mean, I've been in prison for eight years. <laughs> There's not much to miss. She glances down at the clock on her desk, an antique model with physical hands that looks like it was wrenched out of a submarine. A frown spreads across her face. Shit, it's even later than I thought, and I've still got a long way to go before the octopus is fixed. She begins to turn away, her attention fixed on the stack of partially disassembled cyberdex arrayed in front of her. Hang on, Isabel. You still owe me another question. She stops in place. Fidgets. That's true. Go ahead. I need you to tell me what you can about the walled city. Her voice goes cold. Why? Hmm. Because Raymond Black wanted to go in there, and somebody destroyed my life to keep him from doing that. Her cheeks flush, just like they did the last time she averts her eyes. No. I'm sorry, but... No. Later, maybe. But not now. I don't think he would push this way, and I don't think he would push this way either. She seems really distressed. She rarely shows emotion on her face, so probably this one. Alright, Isabel. Maybe next time. Blinking, she turns away and buries herself in the octopus's splayed innards. Please excuse me. I have work to do. Uh, I really wish I was playing a different kind of character so I could have just forced that issue. Damn it. Alright, Gobbit. Let's talk. Okay. I'm guessing that's where the rats sleep. I'm hoping that the rats sleep there and Gobbit sleeps here. Gobbit's nest is pretty much what you'd expect. A pile of clothes on the ground, an overflowing garbage bin surrounded by stacks of instant noodle packets and towers of tinned oysters. Avant-garde posters haphazardly thumbtacked to the walls, overlapping in some places and peeling in others. It feels a lot like an art school dorm room. Alright, so the writers of this game were also artists. Good to know. Gobbit reclines in a corner, cradling a bowl of soup in her hands. At her feet, a cast iron pot simmers away on an electric hot plate. The contents are typical Hong Kong comfort food. Chicken style soya broth, elbow macaroni, tinned ham, and a heaping of scooped a heaping scoop of egg flavored mycoprotein. Ah, true comfort food. As you wind your way through the piles of dirty laundry, Gobbit slowly lifts her head from her bowl to acknowledge you. Hey, Seattle. She chews on the words along with a mouthful of cheap pasta. A corner of her mouth curls into a half smile. How's tricks? Hmm. Yeah. Things have been better. Things have been worse. That's the attitude. Very stoic. Very strong. It's downright inspiring. She skims an oily slab of faux ham off the top of her soup and pops it into her mouth. Now you want to tell me what you're doing in my bedroom? I'm assuming you're not here to admire the view. Oh, but come on. This poster? It's pretty much the most... the best looking thing in this entire ship. Hmm. How did you decide on the name Gobbit, anyway? I didn't. She pops a noodle into her mouth and chews. My mom did. So Gobbit is your given name? Your mother named you after a wad of meat? 
She shrugs. Yeah, sure. I don't think she knew what it meant. She just thought that it sounded pretty. You should get used to that, by the way. People here in Hong Kong like to stand out, and choosing unique names is one of the ways that they do it. Have you had any nightmares recently? Like, bad ones? Her jaw stops working mid-chew. Slowly she nods. Yeah. Yeah, I have. We all have. Everyone in town. Hmm. I'm gonna replace this with Duncan, because otherwise it doesn't follow. Me too, and Duncan. We both just had the same nightmare. Let me guess. You saw the walled city in a black whirlpool and teeth. Thousands and thousands of teeth. She holds up a hand. You don't need an answer. I already know that I'm right, because I just had that same dream. Creepy, I know. Her voice goes quiet. The dreams are coming from inside the walled city. I'm sure of it. All the negative en energy pent up in there. All that pain and anger and poisonous key. It's leaking out. And while we sleep, it's getting into us. Hmm. If you're so sure of that, why stay in Kowloon? Why not pick up and leave? Oh, I was planning on it. But now, with the APB in place, Auntie Chang is the only thing standing between us and a bullet in the head. Believe me, I'd leave if I could, but I'm, not, I'm a lot more frightened of the HKPF than I am of a few bad dreams. At least the dreams can't hurt us. Right? I'm glad one of us isn't terrified by this. She tries on a smile, fails, does her best to laugh it off. Don't worry, Seattle. We're fine here, but, uh, let's talk about something else, huh? I don't, I don't like thinking about the walled city very much. Too many old fears and bad feelings. If you're up to talking about it, I wanted to go over the ambush back on the docks with you. Yeah, she nods slowly, frowning. Yeah, I figured you would. That was a hell of a thing, right? You could say that. It was fucking awful. Nightjar and Gutshot were two of the strongest men I've ever known. Quality Shadowrunners, both of them. I've watched those two fight through situations that kill anyone and come out on top. And how And how do they go out? She mimes holding a rifle, makes a show of peering down the scope. Bang, bang, dead, dead. No blaze of glory, no final speech, just extinguished. Smashed like bugs. Hmm. We would have gone out the same way if you hadn't gotten us out of there. She absentmindedly raises her bowl to her shoulder. A rat crawls over the slope of her back and lowers its head to lap at the broth. It was more rat than me. She's the one who grabbed me by the gut and led us to that sewer entrance. All that I did was follow. Hmm. I'd like to learn more about rat. What kind of totem is she? She slurps thoughtfully at her soup. A clever, a clever one. She's gotten me out of more trouble than I care to mention. Got me into a fair amount of it, too. But I can always count on her to lead me out of hot water when I need her to. I can feel it in my belly, you know? Sort of a tugging sensation. I've long since learned to follow it. I wasn't aware that totems took such direct control of their shamans. Usually they don't. Me and Rat? We have a sort of, we have sort of a special bond. She takes care of me, and I've always done my best to take care of her. Another, another pair of beady eyes blinks up at you from Gobbit's hip. A second rat scurries up her shoulder to join the first. And to pamper her earthly children, like these two, meet madness and folly. Interesting choice of names. I like the way they sound. Mad madness and folly. It has a nice ring to it, right? I will agree with that. She brushes her fingers across the white rat's mottled coat. My girls remind me not to take myself too seriously. I wouldn't trust folly, though. She bites. Do you always let rats drink out of your own bowl? She shrugs. Sure, why not? We're all part of the same nest. Makes as much sense as anything else, I guess. Of course it does. Besides which, I get shot at for a living. I've got better things to worry about than a few stray hairs in my noodles. How did you come across madness and folly? She raises an eyebrow. I looked outside? I mean, they're rats. Hong Kong isn't experiencing a rodent shortage or anything. I like Gobbit the most, I have to admit. Out of all these characters, she seems like the most... I don't want to say human, but definitely the most socially affable. So you just pick them up off the street? Yep, think of them as rescue vermin. 
You could probably do the same if you wanted to. It's easy. Just walk into any alleyway in Kowloon after sundown and stick your hand in the first dumpster or storm drain that you come across. Keep fishing around until you touch fur. I might just have to try that. Um, you probably shouldn't. She continues to brush Folly's coat. The creature chirps happily at her touch. Odds are about 50-50 that you get your hand chewed off. I probably feel bad about that. You seem pretty comfortable with all this. Been running the shadows for a while? She dips her chin. A long time. Started when I was just a kid. Damn. You're still a kid now, got it. What are you, 19? She rolls her shoulders, shrugs. Something like that. Your guess is as good as mine. Doesn't change the fact that I've been doing this for years and you started yesterday. Matter of fact, Seattle, I think I'm going to make a project of you. Take you under my wing, so to speak. You need a wise and a mentor. Might as well be me. Sure, why not? I can use the advice, and I don't see Isabel volunteering for the job anytime soon. You're in? Good. Starting next time you visit, I'm going to teach you all about being a Shadowrunner. She stifles a yawn. You're going to benefit from my bountiful experience. Wait and see. I'll be looking forward to it. Gobbit stretches, stifles, stifles a yawn. Her rats scurry from her shoulders down to her hips. She taps the simmering pot on the floor with, with, a bo with her boot. The soup inside is reduced down to a thick, viscous gravy. You know, Seattle, this has been a nice chat and all, but it's getting late and I still have the rest of a hot pot to power through. So, without wanting this to get awkward... She glances at the door. Yeah, I mean, might as well try to be a nice guest. She'll probably say it's for the rats or something, but might as well. I could help you with that if you wanted. Thanks, but no thanks. Smirking, she rests Folly's coat with the knuckles of her left hand. You can go get your own food. Now would be a good time. All right, all right, I get it. Talk to you later, Gobbit. Yeah, we'll do that. It'll be fun. Yep, I thought it was for the rats. Still had to ask. But that was what. I, but that was what I suspected. All right, so they're out all all out of conversational topics for now. Time to go talk to literally everyone else. Hi, sailor. Let's talk. Three people, possibly locals, are busily hunched over, avidly discussing something beneath their breath. From the looks of them, they appear to be sailors, rough-hewn clothes stained by salt, leathery skin, and an acute awareness of being on land. You watch their feet shuffle awkwardly on the docks. Their whispers are just with an earshot. Nah, I asked Crafty and she said the same. Them dreams is bad. You think we'll lose them at sea? We're supposed to set out soon to make that delivery. What if they follow us? You see the man shudder. Eh, don't think so. Crafty said these things is just affecting right here for now. First sailor points to the ground. As soon as we set sail, dreams will stop. Hey! The third sailor sees you and taps her friends on the arms. They shoot upright. One examines his fingernails, another coughs loudly and begins to hum. And the last pretends she didn't see you. But when they sense your continued stare, the third speaks up. What are you looking at, Landy? Hmm. I overheard you talking about the dreams. I've had them too. You feel an uneasiness past the sailors. Seems anyone who comes by these parts is having them. As soon as they leave, the dreams stop. Right here it is. Any lead is on why they're happening? Let me get a drink here. Ah. Mm. We don't know much ourselves. We've only just returned from our last delivery, but the dreams ambushed us fast enough. Hey, what about that crafty? The sailor turns to you. She runs the five phases. Smart girl. Might know a thing or two about this blight. You ask her and she may have some, something more to say. There's a boat here with a merchant selling goods not too long ago. He leave? The three sailor's suspicions turn into smirks. One snickers to herself. Merchant, he says. That Turk didn't so much as leave as he was chased off by kindly. No sales permit? Not a big lo- No sales permit. Not a big loss, though. The local shops have way better stuff than that small-time hustler. Why don't you look around? You'll find the shop owners here more friendly towards you now that you've gotten the okay from Kindly. Thanks for the tip. They all exchange looks. The first sailor responds, right, and stay careful around these parts. 
Didn't mean to interrupt. See you around. Okay. Handsome Lee. Alright. Seems interesting, but first, let's go talk to these guys. Yin, Yang, and other. Why, if it isn't the young one from before. Gen glances up at you, then returns to the game. Bah, can't you see we're busy? Shu shakes his head at his friend. You never mind him. Is there something else you need? Thanks, good luck with your game. Appreciate it, young man. We'll be seeing you. Alright, so they have nothing else to say. Hello, Reliable Matthews trailer. I couldn't look at that before. The side of Matthew's trailer looks freshly scrubbed. It reeks of kerosene. Bronze swaths of the flaking paint have been removed, revealing the brittled plastic siding, discolored by years of acid rain. You can see the faded black traces of erased graffiti. It reads, Job Stealer. Something, something thumps inside the trailer. You can easily peer in one of the windows. Do it immediately. Inside are dingy, cramped living quarters. Cluttered with broken drones and unwashed dishes. What looks like a rumpled, motley-colored shag carpet is heaped over about half the tiny space, obscuring most of the furniture. After a moment, the shag carpet moves. It rises about a foot and surges slightly towards the window. Surges slightly. That seems a bit oxymoronic. Then it stops, pulsing and fidgeting. It's hard to see it clearly through the built-up grime on the window. Wipe it. The carpet is actually plush-covered drones. Teddy bears, raccoons, little dolls. There must be two dozen inside the caravan. All companionship models. They're all looking at you as if they realize you're not Matthew. They watch, fidgeting. Then, in one coordinated motion, they all lie down and go dormant again. Okay, that's not creepy at all. Hey, Reliable Matthew, let's talk. Reliable Matthew greets you with an expansive grin, sweeping his arms wide. Fist Sensei, beautiful! To what do I owe this unexpected pleasure? Why, you're not here for some robotics, are you? Well, shucks. He rolls his shoulders ostentatiously and sticks his cigarillo casually between his teeth. His eyes have a strained, bloodshot look. It looks like someone vandalized your trailer. Ah, what, you mean the paint? That's just some neighborhood kids, good kids. Having a lark. I nearly fell over laughing when I saw it this morning. Hmm. What exactly are the drones you sell used for? Just about everything. They're helpers to metahumans in all sorts of useful ways. Drones cook, clean, carry messages, lift heavy loads, tend to delicate tasks. Why, drones can even care for the infirm and provide companionship to children. Matthew taps his temple with his finger, meaningfully. Think about it, beautiful. All the boring, dangerous, pa painful jobs that people used to do. The jobs that drones do now. He glances around at Heioi and up at the walled city looming above. Despite, despite his bright eyes and gleaming smile, his voice sounds almost thoughtful. Because of mechanization, we don't force workers to breathe as many chemicals in the refineries. We don't make teenage girls pick silk cocoons out of boiling water. Not anymore. Drones help us. He shakes off his passing air of seriousness, clamps the cigarillo into, in his teeth, thrusts his hands in his pockets. They really are, they are really something else, ain't they? How do people in Hayoi feel about drones? How do people here feel about drones? Why, they love them. Just about every household that can afford drones has drones. You sure you don't want to try out this little UC2 tarantula? It has a great entry-level personal assistant. Reliable Matthew smiles widely, but the edges of his mouth twitch uncomfortably. Drones free people to take skilled jobs. They make the economy more efficient. Drones give poor people services they could never afford otherwise. Why would someone call you a job stealer? No idea. Drones are job makers. He waggles his cigarillo at you. I don't know what you're thinking, Fist Sensei. I think it might. I know what you're thinking, Fist Sensei. I think it myself. Drones take jobs, while medicine takes jobs from undertakers, and zero drones take jobs from people who used to crawl through the filth to feed their families. He holds his hand somberly over his heart, and his voice deepens. When you see a drone messenger made, it's easy to think, that used to be a person. Could be. Could be. But that person can do another job now, and they can have a drone themselves. Everyone's better off. 
Why, Matthew's voice rises. His smile wrinkles painfully around the edges as he carries on enthusiastically. The same people who call drone dealers job stealers often themselves come to me for... Matthew suddenly shuts up. His smile gets even more waxy. Uh, hey, let's not get all wound up about this stuff. It's too cheery a day for running off in our heads. Mm-hmm. Wow, if it's to smell that brisk spring air. He inhales deeply through his nose, drawing in the fetid reek of the polluted river and the sodden heat of the monsoon season. This topic is fascinating, really fascinating, but uh, I've got a... I've got to get back to work. Shall we walk the lot? I noticed you have a lot of drones in your trailer. Reliable Matthew smiles serenely at you. Drones in the trailer? Oh, I think I have a couple in there, probably once I'm fixing. It looked like a full playpen to me. Matthew shrugs uncomfortably. Funny thing about drones, when you see a few, they always look like so many more. Weirdest things, strange little fellas. Let's not talk about maintenance, it's boring. I bet there's something you need today. Goodbye, Matthew. That's not creepy at all. Not at all, not in the slightest. Okay, now there's... Why did the music suddenly get so much more eerie? Also, hi, old lady. Hi. Hey, Maximum Law, I heard you got an opportunity for me. Let's hear it. Maximum Law surveys the docks from beneath his meticulously patched tarpaulin. Goggled and belted with electronics, his arms folded, his expression stern, a sweat-drenched little king. His boat rocks gently. As you approach, he looks sharply your way and breaks into an awkward smile. Hey, Fifth Sensei, I was hoping you'd come around. You got a minute? What's up? Kindly had Wampoa burn your sin. Word is, you're doing, you're doing work for her. Not normal yellow lotus stuff. Law shifts from foot to foot. He fidgets with the hardware on his belt. Shadow running. Hmm. Yes, I'm now an unusual asset. Wicked. Law says it distinctly in a hushed tone, then seems to catch himself. He draws himself up to his full height. His usual demeanor of self-assurance returns. That's pretty ironclad, Fist Sensei. Pretty vicious. If you do good, you'll be noticed. Listen, if you got info about runs, I can make it worth something. We have poets call that kind of thing metadata. Wampoa likes to get the word on the street from the active operators. Hmm. I'll think about it. Yeah, I get it. It's a covert world. Think about it, though. We and Poems manage secrets already. It's what we do. We run the shadow nets. Law looks out through the rain across the rocking boats. He wipes his foggy goggle lenses with a rag from his pocket. His stomach gurgles loudly. Augmented reality goggles aside, this gig gets really boring sometimes. You ever want to talk shop? I'm here. Tell me about Wempoa. We're pretty much the best, yo. What do you want to know? Law folds his arms impatiently as if he's irritated by your request, but he can't stifle a proud grin. Hmm. Just tell me about the tribe. Generally, who are you guys? Law smirks. You really are new to the Kong, aren't you? We're the Neo Matrix Collective. We run the Hong Kong Data Haven and the Kong Shadow Nets. We are the Kong Shadow Nets. Outside the corporate nets is the rest of the Kong, and in those shadows you will find threads of golden light like a vast spider web that carry information. Those golden threads and that web is Wampoa. Law gives a curt, virile nod. My buddy Redstorm wrote that. Pretty wicked, huh? Anyway, we're bleeding edge on the path to the singularity. We're doing things no one else is doing. Anywhere. Except maybe Denver or Tokyo. Our homeland is the Matrix, and we're building a society of truth and expertise and information. What's a Wampoan doing on Kindly's Earth? Are you a liaison? What am I doing here? Law seems shocked at the question. I'm an ambassador. I broker Wampoan's services to Heioi. Emissaries like me are all over the Kong, tying it together in an invisible network. Hmm. 
So you work with so you work with Kindly, doing tech for the Yellow Lotus? Well, I do some work directly with Kindly, but my focus is more at the street level. We're all part of a big machine, each piece playing its critical role. As is so with any highly evolved machine. Exactly. That's why nobody messes with Wampoa. Boom! Does Wampoa provide any technical services for Hong Kong's poor? Sure we do. We run pirate networks. Our services are way more than ordinary people want, though. Or, yeah, than most ordinary people want, though. You can get prepaid bandwidth with a corporate carrier for fractions of a new yen, but you're selling your soul. They monitor it. If you want to operate unmonitored by corporate algorithms, you gotta fly through the Wampoan network. It's the only place to be. Wampoans are coders and deckers for criminals, is that right? We do tech for anyone in the Kong outside the corporate umbrellas. Anyone can use our networks if they pass our vetting and can pay for what we bring. Law speaks without a shred of irony. It's the most extra le it's mostly the extra legal element that needs our scale. I understand someone's killing your elders. His face goes grim. A red light blinks on the VR goggles. A lens whirs quietly, focusing in on you. He grinds his teeth audibly, radiating nervousness and intensity. Yeah, shit's crazy. Full on medieval. I can't talk about it. It's tribal matter. Controlled information, right? We're gonna solve it. That's all outsiders need to know. Actually, I've been contracted to help the elders stop the murders. Wow, really? We're pulling in outsiders? He shakes his head in disbelief. Well, I should have seen that coming. What the hell are you doing here? Go to the garden and help stop that shit. Then come back and tell me what's going on. Everybody's guessing. The elders are being quiet. The rumor hub is going crazy. Thanks for telling me about Wempoa. Outsiders don't understand us. Maybe you can, if you're really smart. We're in a whole different world than most people. Like, I'm seeing three stream videos and live network stats in my goggles right now. Time's wasting, Fist Sensei. You gotta buy something? See you later, Law. You gotta go? Okay, watch your back and suit straight and all. Law grins at you and dexterously flashes the hand sign that Shadowrunners give to each other in Holovid shows. I got things to do, too. So I'm guessing... I admittedly haven't played too many games of the uh, pen and paper Shadowrun. But I'm guessing... Shadowrunners are like modern-day spies in the more corporate sense. Okay, so... I want to go talk to... Okay, well, actually, first I have to go talk to Steven Dynamite because, come on, how could I not talk to Steven Dynamite? A disheveled man in filthy rags teeters on the sidewalk, wobbling on unsteady legs. His bloodshot eyes dart about desperately, and the acrid sweet odor that wafts off of him buzzes unpleasantly in your nostrils. You okay, man? You, you have to help me, my man! His teeth grinds his teeth grind as his grip tightens. His hand feels like a vice. I n -n -n need your help. Okay. Strength 5. Always, When in doubt, always pick the option that you wouldn't have otherwise. Break his grip. The man is thrown to his knees on the pavement. His mouth forms a comical O. He looks up at you and a crooked smile cracks his ruined face. He makes an unsteady bow in your general direction. I could use someone like you. I'd make it worth your while. He peers up at you, eyes wide with expectation. How much money could a wreck like you possibly have? Shaking slightly, the man stands, straightens to the extent that he can, and places a hand on his heart. Oh, d d don't let my appearance fool, fool you. He leans in... T he leans in to speak, and as he does so, you glance down and notice that his tattered clothing bears designer logos. I want you to take a m message from me to Handsome Lee. Never heard of him. Now who are you and why are you touching me? I'm Steven. Steven Dynamite. He nods eagerly, desperation in his eyes. A sluggish tongue wipes itself over the cracked skin of his lips. Look, you gotta help me. I've been p poisoned. That crap that Lee sold me put bad things in my head. Whenever I close my eyes, I see dark, narrow tunnels. So many hands grabbing, razor sharp teeth gnawing, and the ch children. Bad things in your head? Are you talking about hallucinations? 
The junkie stares into space. A faint trickle of saliva makes its way down his chin. No, 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 not exactly. More like nightmares. They feel very real. Teeth biting faces. Faces, I knew. His trembling voice trails off. All right, calm down. I'll do what I can. Then tell Lee what he's done to me. That I need relief. Tell him that I want... What do you want? I want my money back. But he stops and says no more. Poisoned, nightmares, money back, got it. Anything else? Just please come back and please hurry. Okay, so somebody's selling nightmares as a drug. That's got to be rough. Before I do that, I want to talk to Spider Shen. Shen is busily counting out cred sticks as you approach. Shen's hands move quickly, fingers deftly sorting them into small plastic bins. The labels on the bins bear names. Steel Arm Lu, Grandfather Wo, Lucky Ping, and Kindly Chang. Shen's eyes flicker up at you for a fraction of a second before returning to his task. One moment. I'll be done shortly. A few last flicks of the wrist see the financial cred sticks shorted in, sorted into their respective bin, with the lion's share going to Kindly and Steel Arm Lu. There. Now, what can I do for you? First things first, show me what you have for sale. Hmm. Alright. Nothing that I don't already have. Darn. You pay a lot of dues to the Yellow Lotus? Shen shrugs, obviously ind indifferent to the amount the shop's being taxed. I do, but that's how the system works. I pay kindly for the for rent. Steel Arm Lu gets money because he's my superior. Lucky Ping receives a finder's fee for the for goods she sends my way, and Grandfather Wo took me in. He gets paid because he's family, and I owe him for getting me off the streets. You join the organization? You have to pay the dues. It's the same as anywhere else, and it beats the hell out of being homeless in Kowloon. Stuffing the boxes away be below the counter, Shen produces a box of assorted needles and inks and begins cataloging them on a battered PDA. You don't mind paying? Not really. Grandfather Wo saved my life by taking me in, you know. Life expectancy for homeless kids in Aberdeen isn't very good. Because of him, I have skills and friends who will pay to make use of them. It's a good life, all things considered. Shen leans back against a stack of cages, causing the snakes within to hiss and snap at the glass. I'm just a blue lantern, a foot soldier. I answer to White Bing, who I studied with on Wudang Mountain. He's the 49er, the, ma the made man who runs our crew. I don't pay him because he takes his own cut of what we make. That's all for now, Shen. Okay, so Shen is part of a, a small gang who works for a larger gang who works for an even larger gang. Okay, so I want to go to the medical supply shop, which I believe is here. Because I don't think I've ever been here. You again? I thought I told you to fuck off. Kindly will vouch for me. Yeah? You just idle your engine there for a minute, and I'll check on that. There's a long silence on the intercom. The door gives several heavy metallic clicks. There's a dull rumble, like heavy bolts sliding back. A green light flashes on the terminal. The door appears to be unlocked. You can enter the clinic. Alright, let's go. Chrome Alley, let's do it. Ten armed Ambrose. Hello. The clinic looks like it just hosted a party. Spindly mechanical arms swing from unobtrusive wall mounts, pulling down crepe paper, ribbons, and scooping food platters and empty beer bottles into biohazard bags. A severely crippled Caucasian man sits in a wheelchair amidst the maelstrom of mess and robotics. He's in his f 40s. Thick beard, tungsten earrings, beer belly, one cyber eye. Both his legs are missing, one at the hip, the other at the knee. He has only one arm, and only three fingers remain on his surviving hand. His face and arm show the scars of reconstructive surgery. He grins widely at you, regarding you with bloodshot eyes. He's clearly hungover. 
Hey, I'm Ambrose. He shouts, he shouts cheerfully in English, his words piling together in a loose Midwestern accent. They call me Ten Arms. Welcome to the Kong, fellow UCASian. He chuckles, his chest shaking with mirth. Get a drink there. A Walder Arms springs to life and swings over to him. Its menacing metal pincer momentarily sets a cigarette between his lips. Just long enough for him to inhale from it. Kindly says you're alright. What can I do for you? You're a doctor? Sure I am. I'm a rigger. A rigger doctor. A rockter. Ambrose bursts into laughter, then stops and clutches his head. Oh man, I cannot laugh hard today. Too much partying last night. It hurts. I'm not board certified, but don't worry. I should be. I'm full on skilled. My work's yellow lotus guaranteed and precisely in accordance with, word, with World Medical Association standards. Everybody in Hayoi comes to me. Cause I'm the only option. Ambrose chuckles delightedly. Very well, Rockter. Right on. Let's get you tricked out. Unless you just want to bullshit, which I'm down for too. What do you do here? What do I do? Tune-ups and engine rebuilds on your ass. I do it all. First aid, second aid, surgery, cybernetics, obstetrics, euthanasia. I'm your one-stop shop for health and beauty. Well, maybe not beauty. Yeah, this one. I don't modify myself. Any reason I come around here if not for medical gear? Shoot, this is a friendly little neighborhood. I love it when people come by and bullshit. Hell, I host birthdays. Ambrose's spider drone swings a bottle of coffee liqueur over to his nose. He sniffs it gingerly. Nope, that's no good anymore. Full of spit and cigarette ash. What sort of mechanical services do you offer? Oh, nothing you'd be interested in. Right now, I'm mostly doing engine mechanics and electrician stuff. I send Maximum Law and Reliable math wor Matthew any work they can handle. I'm really just a hop. It's really just a hobby in the service of the community. I make my nut with clinic. He looks fondly over at the massive, partially assembled V8 engine occupying part of the opera operating theater. That baby's gonna be a goddess when I'm done with her. Let's talk about something else. Sure thing. You don't mind if I keep cleaning while we talk, do you? Cause I'm gonna. Ambrose bursts into laughter at his own joke. The spindly robotic arms around you redouble their sweeping and wiping. Your front door could stop a bulldozer. Why so fortified? Are you kidding? Have you any idea how much all the stuff in here is worth? This is a high capital operation, and life's dangerous for a guy missing most of his members, tooling up smugglers and criminals. Let me tell you what, though. Someone bursts in here, they're going to be in a world of hurt. Ambrose chuckles evilly. There's a lot more than pipes and wires up in the fall ceiling, and I've got Kindly's crew and the Club 88 boys on the panic button. They know which side their bread is chromed on. What, you thinking of trying to knock me over? He laughs uproariously, but it's not clear if he's kidding. You're from the UCAS Midwest. How'd you land in Hong Kong? Ambrose bites one of his nails and regards you with a hint of suspicion. Well, that's a long story, and kind of personal. It involves some jobs, a girl, a real good reason to leave Chicago, a whole shit ton of guns and money. Hmm. Hong Kong seems like a long way to go to just get a break from Chicago. Ambrose smiles with their steely look in his eyes. Sometimes a guy just needs to change his scene. Guns and money were involved? Sounds like a good story. Shadow running? Yeah, stuff like that. Ambrose smiles. He seems to warm up a little. I was a hardcore vehicle rigger back then, before Johnny Law cracked down on road rigs. Man, those were the cowboy days. Freaky as hell, but great to remember. Ambrose gets a wistful look on his face. We'd rebuild trucks and chop shops, reinforce the frames, pull his armor on, mod the suspension with robotics, drive them right through the front windows, windows of buildings, then bash aside Lone Star Cruises on the way out. Good times. You do that in Hong Kong, you get auto barricades and a missile enema. Crying shame. Anyway, uh, I needed to get out of Shy Town, spread my wings. A nearby spider to her own fidgets. You know how that goes. A girl was involved in you getting here, huh? Yeah, there was. He shrugs awkwardly as to make life as to make light of it. His voice has a hint of strain in it. That's a story for another day. 
Honestly, I have no idea what this is related to. Let me know in the comments if you do, because I have no idea what this is related to. I'll ask about it anyway, though. Ambrose's face darkens. Yeah, I am. It's a terrible thing that just happened there. My good old, my old hood is inside the containment zone. A lot of good peeps locked up behind that wall. Aw, oh, man, I want to talk about that. I heard it's a Vitus Plague outbreak. Yeah, well, maybe. That's the official story. I don't know if you log in Shadowland, but people have been sneaking files out of the zone, showing some kind of crazy-ass giant insects in there. They're calling them bug spirits. Ambrose shakes his head sagly. Vitus Plague, bug spirits, I'm not sure which is more scary. Hell, maybe it's the Walking Dead. Think about it. We've got at least four H HMHBV variants. I think it's only a matter of time until we get zombies. Ambrose gives a nervous shiver. The near, the nearby robotic arms tremble briefly. I take zombies over these bug spirit things. Tell you what. Hey, it's grand digging up wreckage of the past, Vince Sensei, but time's wasting. <coughs> I left Chicago. I landed in the Kong. After a while running the Kong shadows, I landed here in Chrome Alley. That's really just it. Now we better get back to earning a living. Show me your services. Sure thing. Tune up or spare parts. Medical supplies. Okay, so this is where I get my uh, my trauma kits, which I definitely want. Yep, that is exactly how many of those I want him to have. Okay, let's see if I can get that V8 engine. Ambrose bursts into laughter. I like you. I like you. You've got good taste, but that engine is family. Seriously, what do you want? Goodbye, Ambrose. Time for me to go. Cheers, Fist Sensei. Talk to you later. Alright, examine the computer. This impressive home-built computer is running multiple large memory units and processors. Chilled air from its active cooling system washes across you to, to the whir fans. A thin fiber optic cable runs across the floor to Ambrose in his chair. On the wall behind the computer are miscellaneous decorations, notes, and photos. Two items stand out. A large dry erase calendar and a cork board plastered with printouts. Examine the cork board printouts. News clippings and BBS posts have been printed, carefully snipped, and pinned in place. Most are less than a year old. They're intermixed with grainy photographs of what look like a devastated city, Chicago. The news article describes an outbreak of a violent version of the Vitus Plague in the city and the subsequent quarantine of a zone containing hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people. The newest items are plain text bulletin board postings, printed out. The very fact that they're from so crude a site is strange. Very, very few Matrix sites are so plain. Identify the source of the printouts, of course, because Shadowrunners do that. Search your mind for an analogous event. It takes a moment, then a similar set of described conditions come to mind. The 900 Days by, Hal by Harrison Salisbury, a detailed Russian account of the 20th century Nazi siege of Leningrad, Russia. Damn. Files smuggled out from within the containment zone. They describe a cover up the detonation of a small nuclear weapon and the catastrophic release of insect spirits into the city. The current conditions, as reported by drones and escapees, are horrific. Try to parse the source of the strange printouts. The postings are from a simple bulletin board system, such as would usually be used only when bandwidth is at a premium or data has to be sent long distances, like thousands of kilometers. <coughs> you can pick out some recurring statements that seem to refer to the, to the venue. The BBS Shadowland. The primary moderator looks like someone named Captain Chaos. These postings are probably from the North American Dark Matrix site that operates out of the Denver Data Haven, the so-called Shadowland. The Shadowland is supposedly the global mothership of Matrix Havens for runners. I get the feeling the next game might be set here. Return your attention to the wall as a whole. And look at the calendar. The dry erase calendar is cluttered with a relentless storm of commitments written in cramped, sloppy Hanzi. Most appear to be medical appointments with patients, followed by a busy list of social engagements. A close scrutiny reveals others. 
a basic mechanic class on Wednesday nights, basic computer coding Sunday afternoons. Before both of these, Inked and Red Marker is prepare lesson plan, you stupid idiot. Holidays, big combat auto races, birthdays, every Sunday until 4 p.m. is simply labeled engine. Only five hours a night are allocated to sleep, but large swaths of time are conspicuously labeled hangover. I like this guy. It's a shame that I'll have almost no reason to ever see him. This, this electro furnace room has been built out as a medical clinic and a machine shop. The air is alive with the rumble of furnaces and the hum of cooling fans. It is sweltering. The front area is more like a homey coffee house than a clinic lobby. Comfortable old furniture, used digipads, coloring books. <coughs> the wall opposite the boilers is cluttered with a mixture of photos and prints. Local artists work, images of military vehicles, off-road racing, Rube Goldberg machines. Personal photos, old-time Chicago gangsters, the Desert Wars Motorized Combat Division. Lance around the clinic space. The work area looks more like a- oh. Okay. Oh wait, no, this is- this is different. A roboticized operating table and a hydraulic lift support a partly disassembled V8 engine. Occupy- Oh. And a hydraulic lift, that's what it was. Supporting a partly disassembled V8 engine occupy places of equal importance against the north and south walls. Prosthetic limbs are racked overhead like machine parts. A heavy lift hoist is clamped up to an I-beam. An impressive home-built computer sits against the far wall. Several bunkers, several bulkier towers sit under the desk fans whirring. It looks more like a sysadmin's, a sysadmin Decker's server station than a doctor's terminal. The floors are scuffed concrete, stained with grease and old blood. The faint odors of ammonia, gasoline, and antiseptic middle in, mingle in the air. A large sign on the back wall reads, Sanitary Space No Spitting. Inspect the personal photos. The pictures are mostly of Hayway residents, holidays and parties. Ten-armed Ambrose is in many of them. The vast scope of photos suggests that Ambrose must be acquainted with almost everyone in Hayway. Look away. Yeah, it's a pity I'm almost never going to have any reason to see that guy. Oh well. There shouldn't be that many more places to check. I need to go to Club 88. So I'll do that now. And then I need to go see Handsome Lee, who I think I've already seen. Okay, Frederick, let's talk. The young troll bouncer manning the door is in the midst of patting down a prospective patron with enough force to dislocate his shoulder or hip, while other shady-looking patrons walk idly past him into the club. He waves the shaken man inside, propelling him with a final pat on the back. People don't realize what you gotta check for internal weapons, as well as external ones. Hmm. You can't possibly feel an implant. Sure you can. You just need the right technique. Matter of fact, I caught a guy just last week with a phosphorus grenade in his leg compartment. And what did you do? Disarmed him, of course. Got it back behind the bar now. I'm gonna blow it off in the river and press some girls. You looking for a pat down yourself? No, just information. Doubt I can help you much, but I'll try. Are you running any businesses on the side? Nah. I may take the occasional payment to look the other way or be in the can when a fight breaks out, but I have enough on my plate that I can't really take on much else. Training, you see. I love what I do, but you gotta work hard to stay in peak condition. I've also got some next steps in mind, so I'm working even harder toward that. Big plans, you just wait and see. I also play the drums. Why are you searching some people and letting others in? This is a private club. There's three kinds of people I let in. Members, guests of members, and people who make a good case. The latter two get a really good search before they go in the door, unless they're with Kindly Chang or the Emperor of Japan or something. Yeah, those two are roughly comparable in authority. I don't care if someone has a Cyrus Spur or a Holdout Pistol or whatever, but we can't have serious weapons on non-members inside. Ma sells some big stuff, but she puts electronic chair locks in her merchandise till they're out the door, so people don't get dumb ideas. This is a no-assassination safe zone. Serious weapons go into the weapons check, unless you're a member. That way, if a big firefight ever breaks out, the members will have the upper hand. 
We keep the killings very rare. Most happen when some members get all fired up and decide to settle the score with box cutters or something. So I'm a member now? You work for Kindly, as a Shadowrunner no less. That makes you a member. Remember the rules. No fighting unless, you know, it comes down to that. And you're ready to skip off the concrete. No killing either. If you got legitimate killing business, go do it somewhere else. People come here to have a good time. You're really just trying to minimize collateral damage, aren't you? Pretty much. I'll leave you be. Into the club. X flow. All right, let's talk. A wiry elven woman leans over the bar, propped up on one elbow. She glances back at you over her shoulder as you approach, looking a half empty glass glass to her lips. The selection here is total crap, but it's cheap. I hope you're not looking for quality. Or you're gonna be really disappointed. Damn, and I was hoping for some classic cocktails. The woman snorts and dips her pinky into, into her drink to fish out a stray gnat. If you ask real nice, I think they've got some tonic water in the fridge. Aside from that, you're as likely to get drain cleaner as you are a splash of bitters. Even a simple Manhattan is probably beyond the means of this joint. Call me x Flow, by the way. x Flow regards you calmly, her eyes calculating. After a few, after a few seconds, she nods. Maybe we can help each other. How do you mean? I've got good eyes for people in the business, and believe me, you smell like Shadowrunners and Nuyen. Plus, everybody here has been talking about Kindly's new hired help. I'm out here for work. You need any backup? I'm available. What's your specialty? I want the egg that's called a Mystic Adept. Kind of a physical adept magician. I throw spells and I can kill with a touch. I'm rarer than unicorns, my friend. Cheers. Oh yeah, you're super rare. Um, don't mind me. I'm just another one of those. But but no 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 no. You're you're real rare though. Where are you from anyway? All over really. Born and raised in Sydney. Not trying to go for an Australian accent. I will offend way too many people. I've been traveling anywhere this work. Not a whole lot of opportunities for a street kid whose only skills rel relate to beating people up. I've lived in Paris, London, Vladivostok, Caracas, hell, I even spent a year in Johannesburg, but Azania is full of assholes. Your Cantonese is pretty good, I don't hear an accent. Explo taps the base of her neck with two fingers. That's because it's shipped, my only contestant to cyberware. When you move around as much as I do, linguisofts pay for themselves pretty quickly. They're not perfect, but they get the job done. How'd you get into this life? I grew up on the streets, running with running with gangs. Turns out, if you get in enough street fights and have magical potential, things just naturally express themselves. Once that happened, I realized I could charge a lot more than the protection rackets I've been running. Besides, it's not like I know how to do anything else. I've never been to school, I'm sinless. What else am I gonna do? Panhandle for chains? Shake down stuffer shacks for beer money? No thanks, mate. I'd rather life fast, hit hard, and burn out. Any good runner stories? Running a hand through her hair, Explo leans back as she thinks. Yeah, I got a couple. There was this one time I signed on with some mercs in Eastern Europe. They had a job to do near Krasnodar Krasnodarsky Cry, lifting some Abkhazian military software. Man, this has some interesting names. The plan was simple. We'd halo jump from a drone on the Russia side of the border, hike in towards Abkhazian research facility and blast our way in. The Abkhaz forces were supposed to be Matrix hotshots, but crap in ground combat. Simple, right? The elf shakes her head, eyes rolling. No plan ever survives first contact with the enemy, though. Turns out the Abkhazian army had contracted out base security to winter systems. We started getting cut apart before we even breached the first cordon. Did you have to bug out? The Mercs were in pretty dire straits financially. It was a do or die situation for them, literally. They owed too many debts, and if they couldn't deliver, they'd have to be killed. So we pushed in. We were down to five of us by the time we got into the main facility. One of the Mercs, Backloaf, was a big trigger. Was a big. was a rigger. Don't know where I was getting big from. We were hunkered down in a vehicle bay while the Decker did his business, and Backloaf realized one of the APCs hadn't been properly locked down, and it was still gassed up. Came out of that base with a 30mm cannon blazing away. 
Our exit was down at the coast. A river... A riverine? Okay. Patrol boat the mercs had on standby. It was some nervous fighting, but we managed to get out. A bit full of holes, sure, we survived. And that's what counts, eh? See you later, x -Flow. Explo lifts her glass and salute. See ya. You know how to find me if you need me. And let's talk to Henry. Come on, Henry. Talk to me. Patrol Patriarch of Club 88 gently polished his collection of old wooden belaying pins. These are but a few of the nautical touches that struggle vainly to assess to assert their theme against the club's otherwise glassy neopunk decor. Back again. Not just another ship passing in the night, eh? Spend some time in the Navy? No, not the military. Was a merchant marine, though, for many good years. Sounds like you miss it. Do I not strike you as the king of island nightlife? Hmm. You look more like you want to bash the house speakers with those pins. Now there's an idea. So how can I help you? What was it like out on the high seas? Hmm, better when I was younger. Things were simpler then, if not terribly profitable. Got my start at fishing trawlers just barely scraping by. Good folk, though. Over the years, I made a name for myself as one does. Got more regular work on better crews. Eventually earned a spot on a tugboat. Spent the bulk of my years crewing ocean-going tugs for Wu Jing. The big ships, the tankers, the bulkers, the container ships, the seabed miners, they're all run by technical crews and computers now. On the smaller immersion boats, there's still a little sheep seafaring left, but not much. But on the tugs, the supply boats, the salvage craft, that's where there's still a place for old time sailors. It matters if you can wrap a cable on the winch in 30 foot seas, jury rig a diesel engine, and keep the boat on course with just the wheel and the binnacle. After the, br after the bridge windows all blow out, it was a hard life, but good. Why change the vocation? Why does a man give up drinking, or sell his trike, or throw out his porn collection? For a woman, of course, and I had me one hell of a woman. Still do. This place was her dream. A business, a home, for us, together. Hard to deny the worth in that, no matter how much I miss what I once had. No sir, no regrets. No regrets at all. I'll leave you be. Alright, let's talk to the woman herself. Hi, Ermine. Let's talk. It doesn't take a shadow in his eyes to tell who runs Club 88. Even the roughest of patrons show deference to the troll in the back. It also helps as he tends a veritable arsenal of high-grade firearms. Back again, I see. Didn't catch your name before. Didn't catch yours either. I'm Fist Sensei. Ermine Kai Fi. Pleased to meet you. We get a lot of passengers through. After their business with the dock men of the Yellow Lotus, they get escorted here to relax and stop. Then they leave. I'm happy to never know their names, but you're a different story, aren't you? What have you heard? Not much. Yet. So what can I do for you? Tell me a bit more about this place. Club 88? We bought it ten years ago. Before that, my husband crewed ships for Wu Jing. He'd be gone for weeks or sometimes months at a time, and I was sick of it. Raising tr two boys of my own? Troll boys? Ha! We needed something more stable, and I needed a husband at home. So he retired, and we put everything we had saved into this place. The 88 stands for good fortune, and the club has proven worthy of the name. If only some people appreciated that success, that success instead of whining about things they'll never be. Have you heard of a man named Raymond Black? I seem to recall a blurb on the news, but I didn't pay much attention. Not a name I know, and if it was a name worth knowing, I'd know it. I'll leave you be. Alright. Only one more thing left to do. No, this isn't where I need to be. Where is the man who is sweeping up in an infinite cycle for all eternity? Ah, there he is. Oh, and also it seems like there's something we need to do over here. Um, meet Kindly Chang's friend. Okay. 
So we're going to talk to Handsome Lee. We're going to meet Kindly Chang's friend. Then we're going to call this an episode. It's muggy out, even for Heoi in monsoon season. You pause to mop your, your brow. Suddenly, you feel eyes upon you. As you glance up, you meet the tranquil, searching gaze of a man half-hidden in the shadows. He's wearing a crisp, white, tailored shirt. Shirt sleeves neatly rolled, with a dark gray silk tie and smart black trousers. If he's sweating, you don't see it. The man tilts his head ever so slightly in greeting. A newcomer. Welcome. He flashes you a brilliant smile, eyes glinting with amusement. You can just barely detect a faint trace of an accent in his voice. Handsome Lee is the name, purveyor of enhanced sensory experiences. I can see that you've got some tales to tell. Okay, let's see what you got. Kamikaze. Hmm. Re re relaxin. Willpower increased by two, quickness and strength reduced by one. Willpower plus two, but charisma minus, but minus two charisma and intelligence. Hmm. I'll get one of each of these. I won't equip them. I will have them, though. Enjoy that. I mean it. Anything else I can do for you, my friend? I ran into someone with a message for you. Handsome Lee beckons you closer with a language gesture. Language gesture? Well done. That was definitely the words there. A languid gesture. Gesture. I think I can guess. Steven Dynamite? He coolly raises an eyebrow at you. Yeah, actually, that's right, and you're his dealer. He places his hands on his heart in mock indignation. I am the inventor of much acclaimed experimental pharmaceuticals, but why split hairs? Well, your little guinea pig is suffering, claims that a drug you sold him is giving, giving him horrible visions. He pauses thoughtfully. Interesting. And what does he want from me? What do you think? He wants his new yen back. He straightens abruptly from his elegant slouch and juts his chin out. There's absolutely nothing wrong with my latest creation. It was painstakingly designed to elevate the senses and titulate the spirit to the smooth high that I have indulged in myself. Now, if the unfortunate Steven happened to dilute the masterpiece with other, lesser substances, I can hardly be held, held responsible. You don't get it. I don't care whether your drugs work or not. I just want Steve's money. He stares at you for a long moment, then reaches out into his breast pocket. With a deft motion, he pulls out a small packet and presents it to you. There is no money. Not anymore. I have expenses, just as I'm sure that you do. But here, give this to Steven with my regards. What's in the package? A freebie. It's what our, dealer, our dear Steven Dynamite really wants, whether he'll admit it or not. Deliver it with my compliments. His brain is pudding already. More drugs won't help him. The dealer regards you steadily. Of course they won't, but they will bring relief. And if I'm not mistaken, that's what Steven is itching for right about now, correct? What good is, is this temporary fix anyhow? Why bother? Lee acknowledges you with a nod. It's a fair question. Steven's problems won't be resolved overnight. My little gift simply lets him know that someone cares. The hell it does. It keeps him from getting clean. Lee shrugs dismissively. I, ser I seriously doubt that my withholding drugs from Steven would do anything but hurt my pocketbook. He's not trying to kick his habit. He just go to another dealer, so why shouldn't I foster my relationship with the poor man? Anyway, he holds the packet out towards you and gives it a shake. Take this, give it to him. It should help him, at least in the short term. Alright, I'll take it to him. Very good. Please let me know how it goes when you're done. Oh, more bliss. Can I make a free item slot? Oh well, I bought Bliss anyway, I'll just give him that. I want to make sure that all this stuff gets done so I don't have to do any of it in the next episode. 
I want that to be the action episode if there, if it's gonna be this long. I mean, how long have we been going for? An hour and a half? Jesus. Steven Dynamite lolls on the sidewalk. While he jerks less as he moves, his skin has taken on a gray hue and his chest heaves with each labored breath. His sunken eyes swivel towards you. He wets his parts lips and addresses you. Hello, I'm relieved to see you. Thought you might not return. Can't trust anyone. This is a bad place. Hey, Steve. I hate to say it, but you're not looking so hot. Fat tears begin to cascade down his dirty, ruined face. I d d don't want to sleep because of these nightmares. I'm ravenous, so ravenous, but food makes me ill. I've got the shakes real bad, too. I just want this to end. The junkie slumps in place, burrowing his brow. He responds with difficulty. Anyway, th thanks for t t talking to that little b bastard for me. So, you got my money? Lee didn't have your money. He gave me this to pass off to you instead. The junkie's eyes light up at the sight of the packet from Handsome Wee. Oh ho. Hmm. Just to warn you, it's the exact same stuff that you thought was poison. The man waves his hand dismissively. I must have been d d delirious or high at the time. Give it to me. This is a terrible idea. You're messed up bad enough as it is. The junkie indicates the holes in his clothing and, bru and the bruises and scars in his body. Can't get any worse. Hand that packet over. Ooh, I can intimidate him into not doing it? You know what? That makes literally no sense, but let's do it anyway. If you, if you take a hit, I'm going to hit you. Got it? The junkie cowers before you. His eyes blaze with anger, but he relinquishes his grip. Hope you feel proud of bullying sad, stacks, sad sacks like me. I didn't really want that hit anyhow. I'm going to do you a favor by taking this packet away from you. His eyes glitter with tears. Yeah, sure. Sure you are. I am trying to help you, Stephen. Now I want you to tell me about these dreams of yours. He looks up at you, suddenly suspicious. You want to ask about my d -d 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 dreams? Why? Because some really weird stuff is going down in this town, and your story might sh help shed some light on it. He stares at you in the eye, and his voice drops to a sharp whisper. These aren't like ordinary d -d dreams, they're visions, they're so real. I've put all kinds of substances into my body and I've never experienced anything like this. You're practically raving the last time we talked. Explain your dreams to me again, clearly this time. He nods, though his tongue stumbles and stalls as he speaks. I'm walking through a series of d -d dark, narrow halls. It's stinks to high heaven and I run into more people and more people as I move forward. The people are just jostling me but, but I'm starving like I haven't eaten food for days. I just just want some food so I press on. I start seeing children in the crowd. Ch children with terrible burns, disfigured faces. All these people are grabbing at me. He begins to tremble from head to foot and his eyes bulge. I see t teeth all around me. I feel the teeth on me. Bathed in sweat from the effort of speaking, he cradles his head in his arms. Also, sorry if the stuttering is bother you, bothering you. I just want to, like, do the voice about as well as it will be. If we ever talk to this guy again, I'll do it without. At least if you guys tell me to. If not, I'm going to read it with a voice anyway. Okay... You must know that the drugs are making these nightmares worse, right? So why take so many of them? The junkie gives a weary smile, because I need them. I used to get my kicks from explosives. I loved blowing up stuff, seeing glass splintering, solid walls disintegrating, flames licking the sky. Not anymore. Now I stick to needles and pills. Were you a shadow runner? No, not so much. I was a 
bomb maker. I designed custom ordnance. It was a dream job. Plus, it was very lucrative. He rubs his thumb and forefinger together and snaps. Megacorps couldn't get enough of the devices I invented. I was t too high in my own ego to wonder what they were up to. What were the Megacorps doing, then? They were fueling wars. They often managed to sell both sides in conflicts all over the world. Casualties be damned. So by selling them, there's blood on your hands. Already sickly part of the transaction. It's not even as simple as that. The man balls his hands into fists in his lap. I thought my bombs were used in wars against militias, mercenaries, and armies. I didn't think of them as people. But the weapons I developed were used against civilian targets. The man starts digging his rough fingernails to his palms, so hard the tiny crescents of blood stain his palms. I'm from Guizhou. Sichuan has taken over m much of the province, but pockets of resistance remain. These are big political struggles, actions removed from the lives of the ordinary people. Yet the village where I grew up in Guizhou was uh, annihilated. These were tobacco farmers, winemakers, peasants, not military. Tears leak from the man's eyes, tracing narrow lines in his filthy cheeks. I recognize the distinctive patterns, the traces that were left behind. These were my bombs. I used to shatter the landscape of, used to shatter the landscape of my childhood. Okay, Steve, I think that I'm getting what's going on here. I guess that must I must be feeling guilty about the bombs, huh? All the, the blood on my hands. I can feel it all the time. I just like bombs. I didn't want to, anyone to get hurt. He clutches his face, sobbing. How am I ever going to make this go away? How will I live with myself? The d drugs help me forget, but... He shakes his head, a look of utter hopelessness on his face. Hmm... Yeah, especially as somebody on the path to redemption himself, probably this one. Do something to undo the harm you've done. I don't know. Use your imagination, man. The junkie sways mutely in place, gnawing on his chapped lower lip. A minute passes before he manages to speak again. I wouldn't know where to begin. Need time to th think. His voice cracks with emotion. Yeah, probably this. Children are the future, man. Find a charitable organization put in some hours, for starters. The man lowers himself into a squat and hugs his knees. His gaze is somewhat absent and his cheek lays with tears. There are a couple shelters where I used to crash when I was less d -d 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 down and out than I am now. There were lots of families. I could help out. The man pauses, licking his lips, his mouth feeling for the right words. But in the end, I probably need to go home to Guizhou, where I can... Where I can bring myself to... I'll t tell you what. I'll think about it. I'll think real hard. Thinking about it isn't going to be enough. You need to do something. Yeah, I will. His face fills up with something you hadn't seen there before. Determination. I will. I promise. Good for you, Steven Dynamite. Now I need to go all the way back over here. Plus I got myself some free bliss for later. Everyone wins. Now for the last stop on our lore tour of Heioi, the Mahjong Parlor. Okay, first I want to talk to Kindly Chang, then I will talk to Dr. Shen Yang. Kindly Chang appears to be nearing the end of a harsh exchange with Strangler Bao, who is listening intently. So, you tell that little pustule that Auntie Chang isn't fucking happy, you get it? Not happy at all. Don't tell him that I'm displeased. Don't tell him that I didn't take it well. She slams her shot glass on the table. Tell him that I'm extremity chopping mad, and if he doesn't want what happened to Yi to happen to him, he better get his head and his ass wired together and give me that payment today. She raises an eyebrow. Was that message clear enough, Mr. Bao? Yes, Miss Cheng. I'll explain things to him in terms he can understand. Bao steps back and becomes a meat statue once again. Cheng's voice turns treacle sweet when she sees you waiting for her. 
our newly minted Shadow Runner. How are you taking to your new role, Fist Sensei? It's a job, same as any other. I have no doubt, my sweet. I could smell your pragmatism the moment we met. And how is Mr. Gunshow doing with his new life? Don't worry, I have my eye on him. Very good, my dear, very good. She smiles. Was there something specific you came to see me about? Any word on the plastic face man? Haile Chang picks up a mahjong tile and tosses it into the pile into the pile at the center of the table. Not yet. He's elusive. Clearly a man who knows how to stay out of the public eye. But I have my network running. Running, working, running, working. Yep. Yep. Good old running, working. Day and night to find him. And I still have some favors that I can call in if need be. I'll find him. It's only a matter of time. I have good news as well. One of my people managed to tap the communications of the HKPF's Special Duties Unit. If any word of our plastic-faced friends or of Raymond Black crosses their door, I'll be the first to know it. For now, go about your business. I'm sure that more work will come your way any moment. I will contact you when there is news. Okay, can I do anything else for you? Nope. Or... Now let's meet with uh, Dr. Shen Yang over here. Man, everyone has my name. I mean, this guy almost literally has my name. A rotund, balding dwarf in a cheap suit turns to face you, light glints from the heavy gold chains that hang around his neck. When he speaks, the voice that greets your ears is high and nasal and has been contorted into a rough approximation of a New York accent. Pleased to meet ya! Chang was kind enough to arrange this little sit-down between us. He extends a slab-like hand for you for your shake. You could call me Dr. Sheng Yang. Hmm. Pleased to meet you. I'm Fist Sensei. His grip is as soft as his palm is moist. It's like shaking hands with a boneless man with a boneless ham. You share a long, uncomfortably flaccid handshake before he finally releases you. I'm, uh, looking for a little outside help on a problem I've been having. Ordinarily, I'd handle it myself or have some of my friends see to it, but it's kinda delicate, you know? My guys would be noticed before they made any headway on my problem, so I figure, hey, I hire contractors all the time. Might as well get some contractors of a different stripe. Tell me about your problem. Maybe we can help. I run a little film studio, Southern Crown Films. We mostly do trid work, but we record some sims, too. Maybe you've seen some of my stuff. Space Mongols from the Moon, The Flavor of Pomegranates, Ultimate Kill Squad. Can't say I've had the pleasure. Ah, too bad. I'll send some over to Cheng so you can take a look. Anyway, there's this other guy in the industry, and we've been button heads since day one. Name's Neville Ma. He runs the Yellow Spring Studios. No matter what I do, I can't shut him out of the biz. He always manages to get one over on me, steal my stars. He's been running me into the ground with his show called Promises in Moonlight. The star, the star is a girl named Penelope Wong. New talent, but the viewers have been going nuts over her. She's the show's linchpin. Hang on, I'm getting there. So about six months ago, Neville was out in Guangzhou for some hoity-toity party. He's on the road, probably drunk. A semi comes out of nowhere and pow! Wrecks his fancy Eurocar Westwind. Bad luck for Neville, good luck for me. I figure, hey, that's the end of him for the year. And I start playing some new stuff he can't compete with from inside a hospital. You follow me so far? Let me guess, he found a way to compete with you from the hospital. No, worse. The bastard is out of the hospital. He's back in the game, bringing out season two of Promises in Moonlight. I need that show off the air, one way or another. And that, my friend, is where, d is where you come in. Already? That's strange. Tell me about it. He should have been in that hospital for at least three months, and in physical therapy a lot longer. 
Only took him a week to get out. I couldn't freaking believe it. That kind of medical care costs top dollar. He's got a lot of money, but not that much. Recovery time like that means one of two things is going on. Neville could have found himself a silent partner, someone willing to pay top dollar for cutting edge care. I don't think it's likely, but it could have happened. If it ain't that, the smart money says he's skimming off the top of Yellow Springs earnings and not reporting it to the other shareholders. And you want me to look into that, I take it. I need you to go get me some bl something to blackmail Neville with. Find out how he could afford to get out of the hospital so fast. He works out of his penthouse most days, so search his computer, closet, sock drawer, whatever. There's gotta be something incriminating in there. Where is this penthouse? Neville lives in the, Repul in the Repulse Bay. It's this real swanky joint on the south end of Hong Kong Island, by the bay with the same name. I haven't been able to get anybody in to poke around his apartment because the security is too tight. Lucky for you, though, Neville's throwing a party on the mezzanine level with all the shops and a restaurant and balcony and such. He's celebrating the second season launch of his show, and everybody's going to be there. Going to make a real snarl for the building security. You might also want to hit up the party if you can bluff your way in. Everyone close to Neville will be there. Most of them will be three sheets to the wind by the time you get there. Some discreet questioning might get me the dirt that I need. Just remember, if you go to the party, don't use your real name. Go with the Argyle. Should be safe enough. There's nobody in the biz out here with that name, so nobody will ask any questions about how your work's going. Hmm. Couldn't you just make a better show? It's not just a better show, it's Penelope Wong, too. I get her, I get all her fans, too. They'll watch anything she's in. Listen, it's like this. A little blackmail never hurt anybody, alright? Well, except the person you're blackmailing. It's just how things work in the industry. I don't dislike the guy, but I gotta stay on top of the business. Now, the blackmail material is what I need more than anything, but if you can get Penelope Wong out of her contract, I'll pay you extra, got it? I want that star power on my side. One last thing. I don't want you starting the scene while you're there. You interrupt this party, make a mess to trash this apartment, and I'm not paying you. We clear on that? Why the concern? If you're going to hamstring me before I even go on the run, I want to know why. Because it's gosh, and I can't have Ma know what I'm after it. In my business, everybody's got dirty tricks, but if you make it public, you're using them? Dr. Shen Yang draws a finger across his throat. That's it. My career is as dead as the People's Republic of China. Nobody will work for or with me ever again, so don't embarrass me, eh? Got it. Reputation is important. I'll make sure that yours is intact. Glad to hear it. Listen, you do this for me, I'll make sure you're not only paid well, but I'll also tell all my friends that you come highly recommended. You don't seem like you deal with Shadowrunners much. Shadowrunners, Moonlight Prancers, who gives a crap? I got money and a job, I don't care who does it as long as the price is right. What's more, I got a lot of friends around town, and a lot of them run in your circles too. He looks up, eagerness in his eyes. So what, we got a deal? You gonna do it? We have a deal. His grin whines, good man, that's what I like to hear. When you're done, drop Chang a line. I'll come meet you back here and I'll hand over the money. Okay, so let's see what my objectives are. So we've got Travel the Sky Tower, it's damage Wu Wuxing Inks Feng Shui, Meet Kindly Chang's Friend, Go to Wampo to track down a serial killer, Go to Repulse Bay Hotel to, have doctor, to help Dr. Sheng Yang Blackfill Neville Ma. Okay, so what I think we're going to do is go to Wampoa because that sounds really exciting on the next episode. That was a good long lore episode. I'm glad I decided to do this in one batch. Otherwise, this would have taken like freaking four episodes to complete. So, thank you so much for watching. Leave a leave a like and a comment if you like what you saw, especially about 
whether or not you want me to continue doing the voices because after this much time, you're probably going to know what your opinion is on it. And I will see you next time with the more action-y part of Shadowrun Hong Kong. See you then.